Hey, what's up, everybody? Jeremy here. And guys, I'm very excited for the conversation we have today. Uh, as we have somebody that I've known for a number of years, and I really am excited for the topic that we're going to discuss today. As we have JJ Flanzas with us today, and we're going to take a look at, like, you know, really, when what, where does happiness come from? Where does what you create for yourself in life come from? So, JJ, thank you so much for hanging out with me today. You're welcome. I'm gonna just I'm gonna go back and say Flazane just in case anybody I fucked it up again. <laughs> uh, I'm gonna just re-record, re record redo the re intro then if that's fine. Just that's fine. Sec. Say it with me. Flazanes. Flazanes. Yeah. F L I Z A N E S. Like Zanes. Yeah. You know what the worst part is? I probably messed myself up by telling by telling you the wrong way that I've said it before. <laughs> probably. <laughs> All right. So Joseph, you're gonna cut that out and we're just gonna do this again rather than like restarting the file. So Hey, what's up, everybody? Jeremy here. And guys, I'm very excited for the conversation that we're going to have today as we have somebody that I've known for a number of years. And we're going to talk about really like, where does your happiness in life come from? How do you confront life differently? And our guest today is JJ Flazane. So JJ, thank you so much for hanging out with me today. Thanks for having me, Jeremy. It's a pleasure. We've known each other for so long. And it's funny, when we met, we were interviewing other people to be on our shows, and we, at that time, didn't offer each other. So I'm glad that we finally got that around to doing this. Right. <laughs> so I, I want to know a little bit about, about your story, because, you know, you've, you've got a wealth of experience. Um, you know, you've been in the podcast world for a really long time as well. As, I know you and I started around the same time. But, you know, I guess, what, what is your story? Kind of, you know, how did you get here? Haha. <laughs> Okay, bullet point. This is where my media training comes in really well because you tell me there's 30 minutes to the show and I could spend three hours on that story. So I'm going to go boom, boom, boom. Uh, I started out as a actress and entertainer, very right-brained individual, love singing and dancing. I'm a Pisces. I love expression. I love emotion, expression. Happiness has always been something that I have focused on. Like how I feel is very important to me. It always has been. Uh, parlay that into personal training and into using my left brain. Learned that I was pretty freaking smart, actually, uh, when I when I started personal training because I learned science. And I learned mm -hmm. science in a mechanical way that, to me, I could see it. It wasn't like ethereal things. Like when you learn exercise physiology and it's only someone drawing with a black marker different levels of the muscle and you go from le le like level to level, layer to layer, down to, you know, ac down to the, the smallest fibers of a muscle, you, like your brain starts to kind of go like, I don't really get it. Like, yeah, I see it, but it's not clear. And yeah. then when I sort of looked at the body and science mechanically and I could see it, I thought, oh, I get it now. And it all made sense and it kind of clicked in. So here I am, personal training, but with this other side of me that is emotional. And as I was with clients over the years, I would notice and I would always be curious and ask questions. I'm definitely a learner. I've always asked people why they believe what they believe. Why do they feel the way they feel? Why do they do what they do since I can remember? And I did that with religion. I know on my show, you mentioned what you studied. I was raised, my mother was Catholic. My father was Greek Orthodox. My mother converted when I was 13. I was baptized Greek Orthodox. But then through life, I went to school and studied. I did a minor in Christian history and in Judaism. because I, And I would go to different churches and ask what they did. Like, why do you do this and we do this? Why do you believe this and why do you? I've just been curious. So parlay that into I'm now working with clients and I'm using all the scientific things like structure and joint structure and function, physiology, physics. I know how to work a body. I'm a very good person personal trainer. I take into consideration joint integrity and function for and longevity because you only get you only get the cartilage in your joints for a certain amount of time. They're like brake pads and when you wear them down, they go away and you yes. can't replace them very easily. So there are a lot of people doing stupid movements that will wear down your brake pads a lot faster than choosing different movements, if you will, and applications of force on your body that will produce the same kind of muscle hypertrophy and increasing your metabolism that aren't going to wreck your joints. So I stayed personal training for a really long time. I only really retired like four years ago because, because of that attention to detail when it came mm -hmm. to the body. Well, let's take that attention to detail with people that have back pain or neck pain or shoulder pain and all of the all of the hormonal endocrine system physiological you know all of it all the sciences that we apply to the body were not helping to alleviate these situations so i had to start asking different questions and those questions were what else causes back pain well most back pain isn't physical yes it feels physical but it isn't physical it's emotional it's mm -hmm. normally repressed rage 
So when we go down that, Dr. John Sarno's whole career after become, after being a surgeon for 40 years on backs became about teaching people that you don't need back surgery to alleviate back pain because it's not actually as physical as you think it is. It's more rooted in emotions. So that sort of started the connection of the mind-body piece for me. I kind of already knew it was there, but I couldn't articulate it. I didn't have the sciences to back it up. And and then really my whole world like kind of melded together because again, that point of view, emotions, processing emotions. I've come to the place where in my podcasting career, I started with a show called Fit to Love. It was a six day a week audio and video. So two days a week were three camera HD audio shows. And then four days a week were either interviews or solo shows about different topics. Mm -hmm. And then I got an intuitive hit about 350 shows in, 18 months in, that they can't find you, JJ. You're not, you're more detailed and uh, you have information in different categories than you're promoting. Fit to Love does not, cannot tell somebody all the things that you do. It's not the right umbrella. So, okay, so then I took my six days a week. And I split them into six different shows Mm -hmm. and I launched five of them and I made them topic specific. So spirit, purpose, and energy was about spirituality, law of attraction, quantum physics, meditation, intuition, uh, nutrition, alternative medicine, clearly about nutrition, alternative medicine, right? So I took (laughs) all these shows and I, and I put them out into the world and funny enough, the show that kind of took off without me doing anything. In fact, I had nothing to sell anybody. I had no freebies, no downloads, no groups, no products to sell them was spirit, purpose, and energy. Mm -hmm. And that kind of took off. And I thought, whoa, I'd get people after two months saying, I, my life has changed. What, what else do you have? And I'm like, what? I don't know. I don't have anything. So I had to create like a whole new business model from people who were now listening and interested in this, in this information and figure out what to do with them and how can I help them more? So that's kind of where we've gotten to. And I've even, I'd say in the last year and a half, uh, a dear friend who was a guest on my show, Dr. Nisha Winters, she wrote The Metabolic Approach to Cancer. When she came on, she was the first real physician that had a conversation with me about how how important emotional processing is in disease. And it kind of took me aback. I thought, what? Wait a minute. Hold on. You, you're a doctor and you wrote a book about cancer and you are 30 years past a terminal diagnosis and you and I are on the same page about this because I had already known it without a shadow of a doubt. No one could tell me otherwise. 100% in my cells, it is right. But that's a hard concept to tell people because it's so, in their mind, ethereal, right? Non-scientific. And here I have a doctor who's now telling me the same thing. And she has doctors that she trains on her metabolic approach to cancer. And one conversation, four conversations in, I said, hold on, what are you teaching your doctors about processing emotion? And she said, well, I can't really teach them that. There's so much stuff. I'm like, okay, that's what I'm doing. I've got Mm -hmm. trainers because I've come to the place where I think talk therapy is ineffective. I, I did a talk called Three Reasons Why Talk Therapy is Ineffective. Only because, and no disrespect for those of you that have had great success with therapy and you love your therapist and your life really is truly different. But I would get guests that would come, guests that would find me. They'd have, they'd been in therapy five years, seven years. They'd have two sessions with me and their whole life was different. And they're like, oh my God, this is what I've been looking for. It happened so many times. I finally had to claim it. I'm like, all right, I'm going to claim it. <laughs> but I'm an empowerment strategist. It's a different kind of coaching. And, uh, and this stuff can change your life, all of it, from your health, your relationships, your happiness. And, and the great news is that just like with your show, I know that we're the creator of our own reality. Mm-hmm. And it's how much you want to – and the emotions, there are a couple quotes that I'll just quickly run off because they're super powerful. So everyone brace yourself and listen up. Ready? Number one, the only reason that you want what you want is because you think you'll feel better when you have it. Mm-hmm period. All right. If you take that and repeat that to yourself every day, you'll realize that you have access to the feelings faster than you have access to the physical thing. And the fact that you don't even need the physical thing because you're really going for the feeling. But the great thing about quantum physics is that if you get to the feeling, you'll get the thing. So, (laughs) and, and if not the thing you want, a better thing. But it's this, but you know, our feelings, our happiness, our, our emotions are really driving every decision that we make. And most people don't want to even hear about that because they think, oh my God, it's messy, it's painful, it's complicated, it makes my head spin, I don't wanna deal with it, I'm gonna put my head down, I'm gonna do what I do, I'm gonna work for money, I'm gonna have a relationship or status or whatever, and they never take into consideration the driver under every single choice that they do. So that's where I am right now. Well, this I got a couple different things here. I've been taking notes like a madman here, so I don't know if you've seen that, but like the first thing I wanna take a look at because there's a lot to unpack here, curiosity. How do you, um, 
I guess, enkindle more of that in yourself? Like, how do you, I guess, become more curious? Because I think it is an important approach in life. It's an important thing to, to have in how we look at life. How do you approach be, being more curious, if that makes sense? Me personally, or how I would recommend someone who's listening? Well, I guess you personally, it's, it's your, it's, you know, your life experience. Like how have you, how have you approached life to become more curious about the things you deal with and communicate about and learn about? So backing up to the, the, the Pisces child full of emotion and wanting to always feel good or understand why I feel what I feel. And I've got a ton of Sag planets too, which leads to the curiosity. Pisces aren't necessarily curious. Sages are. Sages are normally curious. So I asked myself, well, what I would just notice people mm. reacting differently than I did. In fact, before astrology, I thought everyone was just stupid. <laughs> and I know that's so judgmental, but I was like, how are you not reacting like I'm reacting right now? How am I looking at this thing that's horrifying me and you don't seem to be bothered by it? Again, mm -hmm. I would just think, I just judge people and think, well, you're just a jerk and you must be, you know, have no feeling because how could you be reacting differently? And so astrology started to teach me how people see the world differently, what mm -hmm. they value differently, how they interpret differently. And again, I use so many different levels of interpretive, let's say, uh, models. So astrology is not the only one, but it is a big one. Right. And, uh, but it, it taught me how to see things from a different point of view and how, and that's, and then of course the acting career did the same thing because when I could really embody a character who was unlike myself, mm -hmm. the insight that gives you, it changes you. And, and I didn't really understand how it all fit together until recently when I was like, oh, exactly. Yeah, everyone, everyone take an acting class because until you understand what it's like to put yourself in someone else's shoes for real mm -hmm. on every level from in their body and how they walk and how they talk and what they think, what they believe, what their fears are, it's, it brings compassion. And I guess that's the other thing I'd say is that I really – what I do with people in the world – on my show, in my programs, is I increase their amount of compassion for others, mm -hmm. themselves and others, not just for others without themselves, but how do I look at this differently to feel compassion versus judgment, fear, and, you know, possibly anger? I think that's really important, too, because I know, like, growing up, like, my mom was a very, like, compassionate for others, but to the point of, like, almost martyring herself. Do you know what I mean? And I feel like you, you can't get through life like that, right? Like, you're not going to be very happy going through life with that perspective. Right. And I think that, again, because we either assume or someone didn't model it for us, that everyone believes or interprets things the same way. So the, yeah. the, you asked me how to become more curious. Just just use the word why. Mm -hmm. And and not excessively, not like a five-year-old that can't get their answer and won't stop until you, you know, want to die and fall on the ground. But like, you know, I maybe once a day, just why do I feel this way? Yeah. Why do I think this way? Why does that guy feel that way? Why did that guy react that way? Instead of already assuming you know the story, which you don't, ask yourself, what else could it be that would drive someone to do, act, say what they did or vice versa? Because that will start to bring some compassion and curiosity. Because I promise you, most of you out there who are making up stories about why everybody does what they do, you're wrong. Mm -hmm. But you don't know it. And so you have this anger and pain in your heart and you take it personally and it isn't personal and in fact you don't even know what it is but you don't know that you don't know what it is you but so think about the that, level that's of a really really important point right because like i i had this conversation um with a friend that was like you know upset about like how a mother-in-law treated them right and i'm like no no like the thing you don't understand it's not you it's the idea of you right like i think we take things way too personally like that's a really important point right and, and i'll tell you it's never about you actually it's mm -hmm. never about you. So if someone's even screaming at you, it's still not about you. And when you understand that and when you can hear what they're really saying underneath there, what their needs are, it gives you a whole new level of empowerment and compassion for them and you that you can actually solve the problems. <laughs> the problem is that we we have these issues and we just fight about them and we fight until we think someone's going to give in and, and see our side of it. But, in t but you have to be proactive in the problem solving. And if you can understand, and again, I have very simple tools for all these things, if you can understand what someone's real need is, which is probably very different than yours you both can win yeah. i'm a big believer in win-win situations it's possible you have to get clear about what the story is and what the real need is for each person versus just assume you're fighting about the same thing i i was dying when you're talking about asking questions like a five-year-old so i have a two-year-old and a four-year-old and right now my four-year-old everything is but daddy why and i give her the answer but daddy why okay and i give her the answer but daddy why and i'm just like honey 
sometimes it's just the way things are. And that's usually where the questioning ends. And then she's like, okay, I think that's a good answer, Dad. But no, that's, it, it, it is important to do it from a perspective of like wanting to understand someone. Like if we can understand our world better, we can not be so reactive, right? Like we can be more causative in the situations. And I think that's really important. Um, <clears throat> you talk about, you talk, we're talking about the, the, the doctor you had a conversation with about um, emotional processing and, and, and disease states. And, and I'm curious um, cause I have one viewpoint on this, but I'm curious to kind of get yours. Like, do you think that based on your viewpoint, um, you can further or create disease states in yourself? Oh yeah. Uh, I can, can tell you without a shadow of a doubt that people can create, I'll give my, my... I, I believe that, but a lot of people think I'm crazy, but I think that's very true. Okay. So let me take you through a very simple exercise, everybody. Sure. And I'll ask you, Jeremy, so you can be the example for the audience. Have you ever been embarrassed? Yes. What happens to you when you get embarrassed? You get all warm all over and sometimes sweaty and you kind of want to get out of wherever you are. Great. How about when you have fear? What happens when you have fear? It depends on the situation because sometimes you're like, all right, I'm scared, but I'm going to go at that thing because I don't know what the hell is going to happen otherwise. Um, other times it's just uncertainty, I think. <clears throat> and what about worry or what happens in the body? Like, do you ever get stomach? Does your stomach go? Like if you're nervous? Oh, yeah, you absolutely. Anxiety? your stomach kind of has butterflies or it starts yeah. to turn or kind of cramp a little bit, right? Maybe there's some neck stiffness um, if something should happen. Okay, these are all physical manifestations of emotion. Correct. I would agree. Okay. So if you have a physical manifestation from feeling embarrassed where your face literally can turn red and you start to sweat, what do you think happens when we hold on to anger and toxic emotions for years and years? I would think something not good. Like, like I'm, 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 I think there's a lot of people that like – Yes, they may be predisposed to cancers and things like that. But I think like what you consume and how you make yourself can make those things worse or even, you know, embody them in some ways. We all have the ability. In fact, all of us probably have cancer in us. The difference is epigenetics, mm -hmm. the epigenetics that turn on the genes. No one is you may have a lineage of genes in your family, but epigenetics will prove that you never need to express that gene based on how you see the world, based on how your body responds. Bruce Lipton talks. His first book is called Biology of Belief. OK, I don't know how yeah. much more clear we can get. <laughs> biology of belief. Your biology changes based on your beliefs, mm -hmm. your beliefs cause your feelings of, of something. And so our own body's energy system will turn on and off genes. Yeah. That otherwise, so you have a huge role to play in whether those genes get expressed or not in how you see your life, in how you process emotion, how you hold emotion, how you, what your belief system is. And the, the great news is, Jeremy, you can change all of that. Yeah. I, I come from a long line of men that were dead by my age from colon cancer. I'm doing good and I'm all clean. So it's a good thing. So, and I think that goes to prove what you're just talking about, but I guess like knowing, knowing that, like knowing that how much of an effect we actually have on ourselves physically, like how do we monitor that? How do we, um, I guess kind of check ourselves in a lot of way. How, how do we make sure that we're putting ourselves in a good position to, to, I guess, create a better existence for ourselves? That's a really deep question. So, you know, <laughs> bring it on, bring it on. <laughs> Go as deep as you can go. I, I got it. I, I do this all day. Uh, I love this. Um, so let's first talk about people's lack of being in their bodies or lack of consciousness, lack okay. of being present, because I think we can't talk about this in a real way that means anything if we're not, if we're not understanding our disconnection. Cancer sure. is most of the cancer. Well, I was just I using cancer with, as an example, but there's like lots of other disease states. Oh, absolutely. But I'm going to use cancer just because sure. it's been, it's been quoted as the ultimate disconnect. Sure. It means, so your subconscious lives in your body. 80%, 88% of your brain is subconscious, not conscious. It means you don't know what you're thinking. It means you have belief systems that were programmed in you, even in the womb. <laughs> but, you know, it doesn't have to be after birth. It could literally be in the womb based on the environment that you were brought into and many other factors. But you have, most of us have something that's running the show. We have what I look at as the core wounds. And our core wounds are something that people don't talk about. Even when they go to therapy, they don't do core wound exercises. It takes five years maybe to like recognize there's one of them in there because they tell the same story for five years. But I have an exercise to like make it core wound you know, like right away. Like we look at it like a diagnostic tool of what are we dealing with here? What are the belief systems that are causing all of these choices and all these reactions and all these feelings? But let's move back into how disconnected we are in our bodies. And the first thing is, so I have um, this fun little exercise that is, I call it the three steps to effective communication. It is, it is 
from the work of Dr. Marshall Rosenberg, who wrote Nonviolent Communication. Terrible title. Kept me from reading it for years. Wanted to rewrite that book with a different title and a different point of view. But what I extracted from that, the best of the best, was this sort of feelings and needs list, okay, which is what I have. And I'm happy to give everybody a free copy of this so they can actually go through this process because I'm going to want you to print several copies of this. So the first thing is we have to be present in our bodies, which means you have to shut up, sit still, don't be distracted, not on your phone, not with anything. And first, just be in your body. Because mm-hmm. you, if you can't feel where you hold your emotions, then you're, you're a victim to this numbness, this being in your head, this anxiety-driven disconnection between the head and the body. So we first have to get still. You don't have to meditate, but meditating is great. You can exercise. You can listen to music. But you, you can get grounded in whatever any way you get grounded. But you first have to be able to check in to notice that your back hurts, mm-hmm. that your neck hurts, that your stomach is doing flip-flops, that you're sweating that your heart is beating fast, that you are breathing fast. We have to be able to identify the body sensations to even know there's anything going on that's different. So however you need to get there, get in your body. Mm -hmm. Next, you have to be able to identify what it is you're feeling. Okay, and a feeling, there's a hundred different feeling words on this list. Yeah. And most people have like five. Angry, mad, sad, happy, right? Like there's not, in in the frequency difference between under the anger category, rage, and irritated, right? Like they're very different. Yeah. So you you want to get as specific as possible. I, I very ra- I very rarely rage, but man, I've been irritated. So yeah, I, I, I get you. Right. Well, if someone says I I I feel rage, okay, then back away. <laughs> like if they feel rage, you better like hide because that's like that gives us an indication of the intensity of mm-hmm. the feeling. But sure. if they're irritated, they're just slightly mad and angry. And okay, now we can still be conscious and have this conversation. But you want to have a vocabulary of words of how you feel, not what you think. Most people think, oh, I think this. And they somehow make that a feeling. Like, I think you should blah, blah, blah. Hold on. That's not taking responsibility. How do you feel? What's going on in your body? And that action alone, especially for men, would be amazing. Not because men don't know their feelings, but because, again, it's all about what do I do about it. We're not there yet. We have to be present with what is real for us right now. What's going on in my body? What am I feeling? If you're feeling vulnerable, you're feeling worried, you're feeling scared, you have to be able to acknowledge that because without identifying it properly, we don't know what to do about it yet. It's kind of like right. knowing the game board before you make your move, right? Like, you know, uh, yeah. it, 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 I know it's simple, but it's, it's close. No, you're right. It's, and it's a deep dive into yourself. It doesn't have to be that deep. Just yeah. shut up for a minute. Like, stop, like pay attention. It doesn't have to be super hard. Yeah. And actually, you'll, you'll find it. You'll know it. So number one is, how am I feeling? Number two is, what need is not being met? And here's the thing about the needs. All all negative emotion is, here's my second quote. Lock this down in your brain. All negative emotion is because a need or the perception of a need is not being met. End of story, period. That's it. You have a need, so you're upset about the whole world going in crazy, blah, 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 whatever. Okay, but that's going to dial back into... Your need, your need for security or safety or whatever. Okay, so we have to look at and we and need is not needy. It's not it's not weak. It's not you know it's none of that. There's no judgment. These are 86 basic human needs. Every one of these is a basic human need. We all need acceptance, compassion, creativity, honesty, independence. Okay, all of these things we all need. Sure. So you dial in what the need is, and this isn't this is the hardest part of this exercise. It's super simple, but not very easy because most of us sound like this. Well, I need him to change so that I'm happy. I need her to change. I need them to calm down. I need you guys to be quiet so that I can hear myself think. Okay, right. And that's it, it that's puts the, the responsibility on somebody else. It's what I need them to do, not me. Right, right. So the needs conversation, um, you know, gets a little bit deeper. And I have even a whole course on this. But anyway, and I have a whole show on it. So you can listen to the free podcast that goes along with this if you're interested. Uh, that will take it a little bit deeper, more time than we have right now. The third step, and this, and you're gonna love this step. Um, the third step is. What strategies can I take to get the need met that doesn't require anyone else to be different? Yep. Now, it's strategies because it can't be one. And it can't be – and can people contribute? Absolutely. But can you blame one person for this one need? It's much easier to change yourself than it is to demand somebody else change as well. And and it also makes you a victim. You feel very powerless when one person holds your happiness. When one person has all the answers, you can't yes. you can't give that power to them. You have the power. And if you want to say, well, what if it's with my spouse, my husband, or my wife, and I want more intimacy, and they don't agree to have more intimacy, what do I do then? 
Well, there's several ways we can look at that in terms of what else is intimate to you. What does intimate mean? Is it just, is it getting a massage, not in a sexual way, but you know, is it sexual things you need or is it touch? What is your love language? Intimacy could be gifts. Intimacy could be words. So we want to break that down a little bit so we can get specific and then you can ask for what you need. A lot of couples, a lot of people who have words of affirmation, they are always hurt by everybody else's lack of words because they don't even know what that is. And I said, I tell those people, well, ask the person. So can you tell me something good that I did today? And and they'll be like, sure. And they'll tell you. And you'll be like, that feels so good. Why don't you do that more often? Because my love language isn't words. So it's like bridging the gap of this miscommunication that we have and these different styles of, of love, of communication, of needs. So I think that if we could all and and I, I really, this is one of the very first tools that I took on 100% because I thought if everyone got this, because there's two parts of this, there's first of all going inward, what do I need? What are my needs? What are my feelings? How do I get that met? Being aware of that. The second part is when you get this is to listen differently to others. Don't listen to what they say. Mm-hmm. Listen to what's underneath it. Listen to what what pain they have and what's really underneath that. Oh, it sounds like they have a fear of blah, 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 or they they need, they're not being considered. They're feeling ignored. Okay. Or that's the story they're telling themselves. So these, it's a really awesome tool in both, in both directions. And, um, and you know, I think if, and it's, like I said before, the only reason why you want what you want is because you think you feel better when you have it. So if we can just dial back and know that you have the power to create any emotional state you want, I mean, that's, that's true power. It's really interesting too, because I think it goes along with the people that you know, I'll be happy when I get X, Y, Z, or I'll be happy when I get to blah. And I think what happens is your life passes you by, right? Like you miss everything. Um, And I I feel like as an entrepreneur, sometimes we have a tendency to do that too. Like for me, this is going to sound weird, but like music's really good for me. Um, There's a couple different songs. um, uh, uh, There's a Darius Rucker song and I I totally, I think it's called it, uh, It Won't Be Like This For Long. And like, that was a song that made me remember like, Hey, like your little girl, like one day she's going to be 20 years old and getting married. Like, so you want to remember those, those things. And I think far too often we're trying to get somewhere else rather than where we are. And I think we have to remember that there's, there's life experience there too, you know? Well, because it's that level of perspective. You talked about that when I interviewed you on my show in terms of the six weeks out, the six years out, the six months back, the six years back. It's having perspective that's not just, you know, there's a balance of being present in the moment right here and right now because that's all we have. Yeah. And then also understand where am I going? And am I dra- and am I constantly coloring where I'm going with where I've been by dragging that all forward yeah. instead of thinking that tomorrow's a new day and like it's a new slate or today this next moment like this next moment now this next moment now every moment is a new opportunity mm-hmm. to change where you're going but we often drag the past with us or the fear of the future and we're never present and we never get what we want because we're all boggled down with these ideas that I, in order for me to do it differently it's like teaching history and I have a, a probably very controversial point of view on history. Uh, history is someone's point of view and opinion. And well, it's my- usually written by the person that won, you know, a lot of times. Right. So there's a certain amount of history I wish we'd stop teaching because it only creates more of what has already happened. And then everyone wonders why we're still repeating the same things. Oh, if we don't teach the history, we'll repeat it. I'm like, you're already repeating it because you actually didn't learn what the problem was. You're learning facts and situations that you're then passing on to people in the future when it doesn't matter. What matters was, well, anyway, I'm not going to go down that rabbit hole, but just the whole point is that in order for us to learn our lessons, whatever they may be individually or holistically as a society, we have to really get to these true needs. What are the real, why are we making these decisions? Why are we feeling this way? Why are we having wars? Why are we angry at people? What is my personal need? And then what is our need as a collective? And then how are we actually doing anything about that, both personally and collectively? But ultimately, I'm a big self-empowerment person because I don't care what the collective is doing because I live in my own reality and I'm going to take care of me and get my needs met and let you you all go do your own thing. Well, I, I think there's also uh, like an important balance too, right? Like of um, I'm trying to figure out how to put this. Like there's like being self-determined, right? Determined for self, but there's also being like pan-determined, right? Determined across the group. And I think at some point in time, like there is a balance, right? Because you have to understand like, well, what effect do my actions have for others, right? And you have to kind of balance those two things too. Like I think it is really important because you're the person living this life, but you also have to understand like what effect am I creating by the other things I'm doing? 
And you have to remember that not everyone interprets things the same way. So exactly. you may you may think you're doing something for the whole and they're not receiving it because they're not in the same frequency or belief system to receive it. So ultimately, my position on that would be that if you're living in a state of alignment and love and compassion and freedom and, you know, higher frequency, you are helping others because you're being the example and that's how I, I've noticed my behavior amongst people in my life that have been with my life for maybe, let's say, four or five years. And even in any of my groups, when I have a live event, every time I have a live event, I say, raise your hand if you have seen me grow. Because everyone that comes to my events listens to my podcast. So yeah. I have a long history of people listening to me for a long time. And every and they see me grow. So I get to be the example to say, this stuff is hard and you can do it. I've done it. So can you. And let me teach you how in order to have the life that you want and to continue to grow. So to be the example of that, I think makes a bigger impact also than just telling people what they should do based on what you think they should do. Yeah. So again, I think ultimately it may sound selfish to people like, oh, all you do is care about yourself. Yet I can see how that has led to to changing other people's lives in, mm-hmm. in a positive way. How do you balance, because um, I think it is important to show people like how you're growing and how you're changing, but how do you balance kind of sharing enough with oversharing? Because I think there's also kind of this weird thing right now of like people oversharing where it's almost supposed to make other people like pity them. Whereas like kind of showing people like, this is my experience. This is where I've grown. This is where I'm going. Like, how do you balance that? Well, I think you have to be clear about why you're doing it. I see it too. I see people that are like, oh, all of a sudden I have a certain level of confidence. And so now I'm going to come on to Facebook and I'm going to tell every story, uh, every everything that happens to me. I'm going to tell you everything that every feeling I have, every situation I have. And I'm thinking, and what's the point? Yeah. And for any of those people that have worked with me, I always tell them, so what's in it for them? <laughs> if it doesn't have, I will share a lot. I mean, for crying out loud, I did a whole po- like divorce podcast uh, on on women, men and relationships. Episode 55 is my, I don't know what the number is on any of the others. That's why I keep going back to that one. But that's like me coming out about getting divorced. Episode 56, I think, is the welcome Doug Sandler. <laughs> like, here's Doug Sandler in my life now. But I'm very vulnerable, but it's for a couple different reasons. I feel like after and when I go through something, there's a there's a teaching moment. There's a vulnerability to connect that some people think I'm fearless. And so I want to show them that I'm not fearless. I have fear like you do too. I just don't let fear stop me. And when it comes to an emotional, and for me, it's usually I have to be over the emotional thing first mm-hmm. to see what the teaching tool, the teaching moment is to come back to share that. And I will like to put it in a linear way, like here That's are the things that I did. That's a really great point because I know oftentimes, like, and this is actually something my wife got me doing. My wife's like my life coach. I don't know how to explain this. Um, like, oftentimes when I get either really emotional in any direction about something, um, one of the things that I'll do is I'll write it down in an email as if I was writing it to somebody and save it as a draft so I can kind of like put that emotion there and we'll go take a look at some little while and it helps you to collect your thoughts. Like that, that's worked for me at least. No, it's great. Well, it's being responsible for not puking on somebody, like starting to be blamey and, and, and defensive about something that is going, you know, it's like you're being present with you by writing it yeah. down and getting it out of your head, which is very responsible. And then depending on what you do with it afterwards, you know, I think that's, that's great. What most people do is they just sort of, they react and they don't understand why they're reacting. And the languaging is blame and the languaging is finger pointing. And it doesn't matter who you are. Anytime you come at somebody and want to blame them for how you feel, they're going to be defensive. Yeah, because both their high be- higher being and your higher being knows that that's not actually true. And again, this tool, if you can just take responsibility and like uncover, as I tell people, when you get triggered or when you get upset, don't wait for it to get too big. Come to this list and just notice how am I feeling? What is my need? Because if you learn to get the need met, the feeling goes away. You solve the problem. It doesn't happen again. And you stop <laughs> feeling, you stop feeling this, again, um, victimization that other people control your happiness they don't but that, that's a good point too because i feel like sometimes and this is not every time but sometimes i think people can use like mindfulness and things like that to kind of hide that rather than fixing the problem you get what i'm saying like there's some people that use it as like a drug rather than like because for some people like it, it some points in your life it can be useful right but there's other times people use that as kind of a shield for what's really screwing them up you just linked the first tar- part of this conversation to the last part because in the per- in my personal training world, one of my friends who is a Gemini is a Gemini. Well, because uh, I've met had- some people that are really they're like really mindful, but they're really mean, and I'm like, what are you solving then? <laughs> exactly. He was he's Indian, and he m- has meditated his whole life to the point where he stuffed his anger and rage into his back. 
So you would meet him and you wouldn't feel like he was angry. Why? Because he repressed the crap out of that, pushed it right back down. His meditation was a form of an addiction to repress, not to unleash, not to realign, to repress. It's never about what you do. It's why you do it and how you do it, right? You can you can look at any – I'm not a yes. fan of most – and again, I apologize if this offends anybody, but of most recovery programs for life, I, I get you where you are. You go through a 12 step. Awesome. Guess what? There's a lot more life on the other side of that. But some people get addicted to the meetings and addicted to the 12. Like they just replace whatever the addiction was with this search for validation, knowledge and and in a different way to do it. Oh, so my God. My dad replaced drinking with menthol cough drops. It was the weirdest freaking thing. But anyway. <laughs> yeah. Well, but that's what they don't understand addiction energy it's not the it's not the substance's fault that you needed to repress an emotion yeah right and so you can't blame the substance seriously uh i mean in most cases there might be a few even in tip like for tobacco it's out of your system in 72 hours you can't blame the tobacco fix for you know you having cravings that is an emotional repression that you're used to doing and the people that say oh i have an oral fixation because i used to smoke and now i eat no that's still repression and just you're using food instead it's not <laughs> right so understanding your addictions and by the way everyone listening you have some yeah. we all do everyone Absolutely. has addictive tendencies and my guess is a lot of us are control it's yeah. definitely one of the biggest addictions is to believe that we have control over so much when we have control over so little except what goes on inside of us. And that's kind of been my whole entire journey is to get people to what I call empowerment. I call myself an empowerment strategist because there, there's still – I believe that most of the turmoil that we live with is stuff that we literally can fix ourselves and we can get our needs met. And when you know you have the power to do that, you let everybody else off the hook and life gets easier and you don't have to feel so defensive and you don't have to feel so angry and you don't have to feel so – because you don't even understand what's really going on because you just keep replaying the story. It ends up becoming like self-abuse. So I love to give people tools to free them from this cycle. JJ, this has been awesome. This has been a really, really great conversation for people listening. Um, if they want to connect with you, if they want to find out more about your content, what you're putting out there, what's going to be the best place for our listeners to go? Well, if you're going on a website, go to jjflizanes.com, J-J-F-L-I-Z-A-N-E-S.com. Uh, and I have a podcast page. I have a podcast network called the Empowering Minds Network. But my flagship show, as I said in the beginning, was Spirit, Purpose, and Energy. But some of the same content lives on Nutritional Alternative Medicine, Health and Wealth, Fit to Love. Uh, so just, yeah, everything is there on jjflizanes.com. Very cool. Well, JJ Flizanes, thank you so much for hanging out with me today. Thanks, Jeremy.